building happy homes. This is going to be our Sunday school lesson for the next few weeks. There's 10 principles. It's not going to be a 10 week lesson. Today, for example, we're covering two principles. So I, just want, I do want to review that again the principles because as we talked about last week, laws have loopholes and you can get off on technicality. Principles have no loopholes. Last week, the, the principle we talked about was a purposeful priority. Who is that priority? God. Well, it's not a hard question. I'm sorry for those who are watching. We do believe that God is our priority. And if God is our priority, then his church and his church family is a priority. And we need to make that the priority that it is. And we mentioned how we must build wisely, build our happy home wisely, because eternity is not a short voyage. Can you, eternity is such a mind-boggling idea. I mean, let's take Patty, for example. Patty is so old. She has been alive for so long. And you could double that. And then double it again. And then double it again and you haven't even started. Wow. What an eternity. To know that you will never start. I remember being in school and you could almost, it was a long time thinking how long the school year lasts. And being on deployment, we used to count it down by laundry days. How many more laundry days we had until we got to come home or. You have a thousand birthdays and still have never started. What a concept. Today, we're going to talk about a pattern of prayer. And I say this with conviction because I have not done as well of a job as I would have liked in the concept of family prayer. If, if I could have changed one thing over raising my kids, I would have focused more on family prayer. I believe my kids pray, and they know I pray, and we all pray, but we don't pray together. And there's no excuse for that, and I'm just being transparent and honest that I, I failed there. I wish I had done a better job. Family prayer, it, it's so universal at its application that the result is the hallmark of a happy home. The old expression is a family that prays together. Stays together. Oh, that one you know. Yes. <laughs> I forgot my daughter is in here. I need to be careful about what I say. <laughs> Parents, you know, we lead them in prayer. And as they're young kids, it warms our heart when we ask them to say a prayer. And we listen to them do the best they can. But we really need to learn to grow from each other's prayers. And we really need to make that a hallmark of your home, the family prayer. Family prayer is the greatest deterrent to sin, and hence the most beneficial, the most beneficent provider of joy and happiness. Think about the, the, the safety that your kids must feel if they know they're going home a house of prayer. Think about the security that your family has if they know that no matter what happens every morning they're going to pray together. Right? Maybe you do it at night, whatever the case may be. And you know what happens when you continually pray for someone? You start to lose a little bit of bitterness and you start to want to see a return of your investment and you start to care. It's hard to root against the person you're praying for. You don't want to waste your prayer. So the family grows closer. Family prayer is the greatest deterrent to sin and, and hence the most beneficial provider. I guess what I got yet. The family that does pray together is stays together. Praying together allows for the best feeling towards one another. Scholars here, she'll tell you, and I've told y'all before, I, I was really big on uh, trying to get my kids to 
work together. I, I was really big. If, if I could get them to team up against me, I would try to let them get away with more stuff. If one of them would take up for the other when it was in trouble, I would reward that by not punishing them because I wanted them to have a bond. And while it may have worked, it didn't work as good as if I had focused more on sibling prayer. I'm telling you, we need family prayer in our lives. That's why I do love the fact our church has, on average, at least one monthly prayer meeting. You know, one prayer meeting a month, and I love that. And I hate that we can't do it the way we would want to do it. We can't be as intimate and as close as we would like. And I hate that some people don't come... If we're all here, we're all praying for each other. Jamie, I pray for you when you're not here. I miss you. I miss y'all too. I notice. Where's she at? Danny, man, I notice when you're not here. Our family needs to come together and pray together. And then we'll fill that hole when that person's not there. And we need to fill that hole. That way we take it personal and we don't want to miss because we don't want someone else to fill that hole when we're not there. We need to be accountable to each other. And that's nowhere near here. <laughs> that's nothing to do with the principle I'm talking about. That's just something on my heart. Now, there's two types or two aspects to prayer I want to talk about. Quantity and quality. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 says to pray without ceasing. That does not mean 100%, 24 hours, 24 Hours and seven days a week, all you're doing is praying. No, 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 no. That means praying is your lifestyle. Every day, throughout the day, your mind is on God and you're talking to Him. If you only pray over your meals and at church services, you don't have a prayer life. If you only pray when you're about to hit that tree, you don't have a prayer life. Pray without ceasing. Every biblical principle is balanced and attainable when looking at prayer that, that still remains true. For every ounce of quantity, you have to have your quality. You, if you were to pray every day, but all it was was your rehearsed, scriptured prayer that you just read off of a piece of paper, and all you're doing is reading that every day, ten times a day, you're not gaining anything. Prayer is not reciting words. When Jesus told him to pray as he does, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, he was not giving them a script, but a pattern. He was giving them an idea to follow. Make sure you acknowledge and you honor who you're praying to. He was, so many times today, people will just recite that and they think they're good, and they're missing the point. That's my biggest problem with the world's idea of the sinner's prayer. At its core, it's a great prayer. It does take a confession and a revelation that, yes, I am a sinner. God, I need you in my, in my life, in my heart. But if all you're doing is repeating that to somebody, you haven't changed anything. But if you can get it in your heart, and if your heart can speak the word, now we're talking to God. Does that make sense today? Quantity is vital, as we must have that never-ending mindset of prayer. And it, Quantity is great because the more you pray, the more you pray. As you begin to apply the principle of prayer and, and implement it in your home, the more prayer will become a regular, permanent part of your daily life. If you want a prayer life, it starts by praying and praying often. Don't worry about shouting the wall down the first couple times you pray. Don't worry about having the prayer life of a 90-year-old prayer warrior who's been living for God their whole life. You just get in there and start praying, and the quality will build. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So the, when I talk about the importance of quality, it's a process. It starts with quantity. Pray more, pray often, and the quality will come if you're intentional about it. Now, James 5, 16 I love the last part of the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Not the rehearsed, not the bored, 
not the habitual, not the forced. I remember as a young kid, I didn't want to pray for certain people, but I did so because I felt I had to. I know some adults do that today. God bless so and so. But if you don't, that's fine. I just feel like I have to say the words. Pastor tells me I gotta love them. Jerks. <laughs> you may never say those words, but your heart has them, and you act like it, and you feel like it. So those prayers are useless. Our homes need effectual prayer. We need prayers that will reach heaven and change our hearts. I've told you before, and I mean it, don't be afraid to grab your own bottle of oil and go anoint. There's no difference between my hand and your hand. It does not take a preacher to anoint your home. It takes a believer. Go ahead and take it. And while I'm on the subject, I have to mention this every time. The longer I'm here, the more you hear it, you might as well get used to it. If you're going to anoint your home, the Bible is full of symbolic. From beginning to the ending, the smitten rock, the, the cross with the, the serpent, everything. He loves the symbology, right? So don't be afraid to grab a doorway and pray about what comes in and what comes out that, that house. Don't be afraid to grab that mirror and pray that you see what he sees. Don't be afraid to grab that bed. And I'm not naive. I don't want you to grease up your pillow. Grab the underside of it and pray that you're not comfortable until God is comfortable. Don't pray that, though, unless you mean it. Pray here for somebody. A woman was having problems with her marriage. And she, I warned her and said, no, we're going to pray this. This is what you want. You want him to be awake to God and everything. So don't come complaining about the process. She thought she was ready. We prayed for his bed, anointed his bed. Lord, don't let him be comfortable until you're comfortable. It wasn't for a couple days she was complaining about the terror that he was because he wasn't getting any sleep and he was moody and cranky. <laughs> what you asked for? So go ahead. Put that prayer in your home. Take the menu. Check the expiration date on your oil. Some of us will buy a little bottle of vegetable oil. The one, the bottle that was here when I got here was expired. And I didn't realize it until I put, until I burned some foreheads. <laughs> and I got some complaints. <laughs> After my forehead burning. <laughs> Look at the date. Oh! It is a little out of date. How do you like them out? Check your date. Now, because what does that say about your prayer life? What does it say? You bought it one time, you use it maybe once, maybe twice in 10 years, and you think you've done something. In the meantime, the anointing has expired. Now, that's up for debate. People will get on to me. Well, you ain't that much God. Prayers don't expire. Your intent does. Your intentions does. And that's what I'm referring to when I say check the date. If you haven't touched your bottle in so, in so long that it has expired, that speaks volumes to your prayer life. And I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm just trying to be honest. Little things like that matter. When we pay attention to those little things, the big things will add up. Then we'll be casting mountains into seas. Can you imagine being one of those prayer warriors? As your family spends time in prayer, the more God will be revealed in your family. The more of a taste they get of grace, the perfection and love that he reveals through the prayer, the more they will know him and the more they will want him. Hallelujah. Talk about taste and see. I skipped an entire section of my notes. How do you love them out? We're getting to the third principle here. A beautiful boundary. Did I pass that already? There we go. A beautiful boundary. Kids don't like boundaries, do they? Can we all agree that children do not, do not like boundaries? Let me rephrase that word then. Immature 
people do not like boundaries. Because you can be 50 years old, and if you don't like boundaries, it's because you're immature. But well, Scott, I'm a grown man. You're going to tell me what I can and can't do? You're supposed to like a child. The Bible, Bible says uh, he chastises whom he loves. Y'all may not know the preacher, but there is a preacher in our organization named Scott Graham. And he preached a world-renowned message years ago called, Where Does the Mountain Start? And he's referring to Moses in, in the Exodus. And Moses is told to build, you know, honor this mountain. And only Moses and Aaron can go up the mountain. And whosoever touches that mountain that's not of the chosen will die. So they built a boundary. To protect anybody from touching the forbidden. But the question is, where does the mountain start? Because um, scientifically speaking, where really where does the, the land start to go up at? Because it may be a slow incline, and you may be closer to the mountain than you think. So as a matter of safety and protection, they'll they move that boundary. Well, safe zone. And here we are wanting to know, can I get away with this and still go to heaven? Is this really is this really going to send me to hell? I don't deal with heaven or hell issues. I deal with God, are you pleased or not pleased? I'm getting past my notes again. And I feel like I'm meddling. Maybe someone will say that's pastor. But someone needs to understand that boundaries are here. Because he loves us. Boundaries are beautiful when they're governed by the word of God. I talked about that last week. The difference between legalism and standards, so to speak. If I make up my rules and tell you that they're just my rules, there's no harm in it if I tell you it's just my rules. But if I tell you that the Bible says thou shalt not, you really need to not. Because he did it out of love. There's a reason why he tells women to dress modestly. Because there's an evil out there that will that wants to ruin your world. And they will ruin it if you give them an opportunity. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down without walls. And without walls, now that are broken down in without walls. Boundaries serve as a protection and a prevention. It's not always about keeping you in. It's about keeping the world out. Whether you live alone or a single parent or if you are married, you must have some principles and guidelines that remain no matter the circumstances. You have to. You have to have rules. I want to go back because we didn't talk about that Nehemiah one. Y'all know the story of Nehemiah? Nehemiah, in the ch chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. When Nehemiah heard of the tragedy that had taken place in Jerusalem, it broke his heart. When the walls had been torn down, he mourned. He wept because he understood the significance of no walls around Jerusalem. He wasn't afraid that people could go out. He was afraid that the enemy could now come in. If you have no boundary in your home, you're telling the devil, come on in. If you have no rules for your kids, if you have no rules for each other, you're telling the devil, nothing in here is important. Because what do you do with your money? You lock it up. You store it in a bank. You put it in a safe. That which is important to you, you secure it. And that which you leave out and free, it's not important to you. So don't tell them, don't come complaining to me over the years as we get 
to know each other. If I if I preaching God's boundaries, don't complain about God's rules because it's there to protect you. When there are no boundaries, there is no protection. We want to guard those precious things. Commandments, specific to only one aspect of the rule. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, such as thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Those are commandments, but they're only specific to one aspect. But the principles are applied through the teaching, are applied through teaching the spirit of the law, such as 2 Corinthians 3 and 6, and covers an entire subject. That leaves no room for those loopholes. Why should you not steal? Because it's not yours. Because you did not work for it. And if you do, if you do want it, then you need to earn it and achieve it. And you're robbing yourself of the personal growth required to achieve that. That's why I got a problem raising the minimum wage. I'm sorry. My daddy taught me when I was young. A man is worth his wage. I've held minimum wage jobs. And you know what? There was not enough to feed my family. I didn't go to my boss and ask for a wage. I got another minimum wage job and went to night school. Did what I had to do to get a degree to achieve what I wanted to achieve. If I had sat there and said, give me more money, I would still be flipping burgers, no offense, as a grown man, and I would have never have achieved the satisfaction of becoming the IT guy that I am today. And I enjoy my career. That makes sense? Without hurting any feelings? Minimum wage jobs are not meant to provide families. They're stepping stones. And that's this kind of thing about the commandments and the principles. Thou shalt not covet. You know why you shouldn't covet? Because to, to covet means you're looking at what someone else has and you're not paying attention to what you have. It's a matter of lack of gratitude. That's why there's boundaries. And those are just a couple of examples of the rules. It's protecting your soul. It's protecting who you are as a person by honoring these rules. Psalms 101. Here's an example of principles. Psalms 101.3 says, To set no wicked thing upon, before the eyes. It doesn't give a list, but a principle. It doesn't tell you what a wicked thing is. It just tells you don't do it. This applies to any form of visual content. All things are covered under this principle. A specific command would only be limited to one specific form, but a principle leaves no part of the subject untouched. We're going back to modesty. I, I, I came out of my heart. Here it is again. The principles of modesty for men and women. 1 Timothy 2 and 8 and 9. They protect the sacredness of marriage, purity, and gender identity. There is not a list of all things we should and should not do, but the principle behind the mandate guides us in our modern lives and gives direction to what is pleasing to God. There, are, there will never be a list long enough to cover every boundary. But principles help guide boundaries when it comes to areas of our lives that are not explicitly mentioned in Scripture. For example, modern technology was obviously not a factor in the Bible. However, it is very much an important one today. How do we govern something as important as technology use when the Bible never mentions it specifically? We take the principles such as the ones above and use their guidance to build boundaries that will protect our homes, even in the new and unfamiliar things of the world. That's pretty powerful. Because in our movement, UPCI, they had a huge, 20 years ago, this thing right here was preached against. Not the content. The actual box. If you had the TV box in, in your home as UPCI preacher or member, you were looked down upon. That was as recently as 20 years ago. There are some today that from that age that still hold that mindset, but here's the problem. Technology left the box. We have watches that does everything that box used to do. While they may 
not have had the foresight of technology 20 years ago. Thousands of years ago, God put it upon a writer's heart to set no evil thing before your eyes. That scripture tells you what not to put on that box. Ain't that beautiful? How the scripture then still applies to today in principle. Man, I love that. To me, that smacks in the faith of smacks the atheist in the face. The wisdom put into that. The principle covers anything you have today. Thank you, Lord, for providing us these wonderful boundaries. And you know why he put that boundary there? Because if you put the wrong thing on that box, the Bible says the eyes are the, the window to your soul. gets a hold of you. It gives you a false sense of reality. A false expectation. And it distorts your world. You know what? Let's, for, let's forget anything vulgar. Let's talk about modern news. If you put modern news on there, you're, you're gullible. CNN and Fox News alike are just as evil. They are not there to provide you with information. They are there to persuade you to what they want you to perceive. And you can see the difference in people. People who wear this in their own car by themselves watch too much CNN. You see them. Maybe I'm missing. I'm just telling you there's principles and the rules in the Bible are here to guide us and to protect us. It's as simple as that. Every boundary is beautiful because it guards the precious things in our home. So in summary, prayer in the home and explain those rules to your children. Some of us are too late. Some of us have kids that we didn't explain the why. All we told them was not to do this, not to do this, not to do this, and they grew up and they never knew the why, so guess what they did when they got old enough? They did it. Because they honored you as a parent in their home, but now that they're on adult, they don't have that conviction in their heart. But if you tell them why you don't act that way, if you tell them why we don't talk that way, if you tell them why we don't dress that way, well, now they understand the principle. We're going to be talking a lot about principle. Do you have any questions this morning about this lesson? You said there was a slide with Psalms on it, and I think you switched it, but I didn't read it. Yeah. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's safe. I don't have a glasses on. Right? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. That's why I skipped the entire section. Huh? I can't I don't have my glasses on. Psalms thirty four and eight. And what that's what that's explaining, Skylar, is the more you get to know God, the more you'll get to see how good he is. It's not enough to come to church and sing his songs if you don't have a walk with him, if you don't have a talk with him. Going to church, by, just going to church, is not enough to save you. The, the more you spend time with him, the more you will want to spend time with him. But you got to get that first bite. Just to give honor, I actually use this scripture to describe my pastor, Brother Aldrich. He's a very hands-off person. Uh, I've, I've known pastors that are very hands-on. They, they want to have a say in every aspect of your life, and they want to give their two cents and guard you. Well, the audience will stand right here with his hands behind his back and watch you fail. But, oh, but if you were to ask him and go to him for help, what a blessing. 
he believes in letting animals be animals. That's what it is. He doesn't believe in babying anybody. And Patty will tell you, I mean, I can go all the right. He's, he has a mature church. <laughs> you're you're going to have to have thick skin because he won't baby you. But man, I love that man. So I always say, if you want to know how good he is, you got to talk to him. Tyler, do you understand the description of that baby at all? Anything else? Tyler, can you turn off that recording? Take a break. You know, uh, actually, Grand Dome. Don't retrieve my classes.